Um, hi, everybody. My name is Eric Owens, and I'm the director of the International Studies Program here at Boston College. And I'd like to welcome you all to our weekly installment of the Fireside Chat with BC Public Health Experts. Uh, this has been a really terrific uh, young tradition and um, a source of community for a lot of us and definitely a source of information for me and many others as well. So I'm glad that you're joining us today. Uh, we are recording this session and it will be posted by Boston College in the next day or two. And so I um, encourage you to share uh, that link uh, widely. And of course, uh, using the same Zoom URL, you'll be able to uh, join us every Tuesday through the end of the semester uh, to meet with uh, Nadia and Phil and our other BC experts who join us. Uh, for those who are unfamiliar with the fireside chat concept, uh, the fireside chats were a series of evening radio addresses given by United States President Franklin Roosevelt between 1933 and 1944 during the Great Depression and into the World War II. Uh, using radio as a direct means of communicating with citizens, he was able to quell rumors and explain his policies in a manner that offered not just comfort, but also leadership during times of great uncertainty and even despair. So we are bringing together experts uh, uh, here in these online fireside chats uh, through another relatively new medium uh, to hopefully bring a similar level of intimacy and community to these important conversations. Each week we've been joined by professors Nadia Abulazam, uh, assistant professor in the Cannell School of Nursing, as well as Dr. Phil Landrigan, professor of biology and director of BC's program in global public health and the common good. And today I'm really uh, uh, pleased that Professor Andrea Vicini can join us as well. He is the Walsh Professor of Bioethics and a Professor of Theology here at Boston College. He's also a Jesuit and a trained uh, pediatrician. And so uh, he brings with us uh, a wide array of expertise that we'll be leaning on today. Um, typically we begin with Nadia who gives a short update on the numbers uh, and epidemiological issues around those numbers. And then we move to uh, Dr. Uh, Landrigan for a little more medical um, issues. And then we'll have a little more extended comments by Professor Vicini. Um, and then we'll open for questions for the last half of the session as always. So Nadia, why don't you get us started again? Sure, thank you for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here. And as always, it's really wonderful to see uh, faculty, uh, students, staff uh, from across campus joining us today. Um, so I'm gonna start the way that I've started the past few weeks, which is a look at the Johns Hopkins map. Uh, which allows us to see the total number of confirmed cases worldwide, which we all have heard now is well over 1 million, and the total number of deaths worldwide, which is well over 75,000. And I'm gonna look specifically now at the US numbers. And what we see in the United States is that we have well over 350 confirmed case, 350,000 confirmed cases, and well over um, 10,000 deaths at about 11,000 deaths uh, nationwide. Um, and so some of the things, uh, I'll just also note that on the bottom right-hand corner here, you'll see a curve with yellow dots. I mentioned last week that the shape of that curve um, is pretty discouraging in the sense that we are still on that exponential increasing part of that curve. Uh, we haven't seen any potential for flattening of new cases, unfortunately, uh, which just indicates to me that you know we're, the epidemic is still growing. Uh, there's still an opportunity to participate in some prevention activities, as we all are with our social distancing. Um, and um, I just wanted to talk about a few things that I've been hearing, talking about, thinking about this week. Um, one of which is sort of the disparities in relation to who is moving around still across the country. Um, so this uh, graphic by the New York Times is meant to show you where people are still traveling. So the darker red, and I'm having trouble getting it here on the same uh, screen, but the darker red, red means that people are traveling about the same as normal um, as we were in February, whereas the gray color means that people have restricted their travel completely. Um, and so what you can see is that still in many parts of the country, people are maintaining their normal activities. Um, this is likely due to differences in state and local policies on what is recommended in terms of social distancing. Um, and I just will echo what I sort of said last week about how this will likely uh, impact the patterns of spread that we will see in these different uh, places. Um, and so there's a lot of really interesting um, graphics on this, uh, on this page and I'm, I'll be happy to share it with you. 
But one of the interesting um, things about this is, um, you know, the South and many parts of the middle of the country have not really participated in significant social distancing efforts at reducing people's travel. And unfortunately, we're seeing very large epidemics in many parts of the South, um, including uh, Miami um, and including uh, New Orleans, which I mentioned last week. Um, this is also reflected in another piece that um, Phil had forwarded me and I had seen as well, which is what are the chances of an epidemic happening um, in different parts of the country. And what's really interesting about this model in particular is that if a particular county, state, uh, and specifically a county in this model, uh, reaches 43 or more cases, uh, that essentially the chances of an epidemic occurring are 100%. And so we see that in many highly populated areas, um, we are expecting very large epidemics to take place. Um, so this is, of course, related to uh, the social distancing measures, but also related to people's other behaviors related to the amounts of uh, prevention messaging that are taking place in each of these locations. Um, and also density as well, I think is a really important uh, part of this. Now I will mention something else that I've been thinking about quite a bit and has been receiving a bit of uh, media attention, which is that we are seeing very large racial disparities in who is being tested for coronavirus um, and who is dying from coronavirus nationwide. And these disparities are being reported across the country, but the latest data that I've seen is coming out of Chicago, um, which is showing that um, despite uh, sort of the black population only uh, composing between 30% uh, and 50% of residents in particular areas, the number of cases and deaths um, that are attributed um, to the black population is well over 50 and 70% in some cases. So you can see that we're already starting to see some stark racial disparities in who's being affected. Um, this is likely due to a number of other social determinants of health in these particular areas. Uh, but I wanted to bring that to people's attention because I think it's something that we will need to think about. Um, what are the disparities that we will see in COVID-19? How is it that we can try to uh, stop these inequities from taking place? And the last thing I've been thinking about quite a bit, and I've actually, I'll admittedly have been struggling quite a bit with is uh, the changes in the recommendations related to mask wearing in public. Um, so initially at the beginning of this epidemic, um, the messaging that we were receiving from the CDC and from other organizations was that only individuals who were sick should be wearing um, masks to prevent the transmission to other people. As you've probably heard, the messaging now is that everyone who is going out into the public, if they need to go out into the public, uh, should really be wearing a mask. And um, I think that this sort of raises a number of questions related to uh, supply and resource um, needs of the public now with regard to masks. Uh, I know a lot of people are making masks at home out of fabric and cotton. Um, and obviously we're not expecting people to wear medical grade masks out and about. But I do think that this uh, warrants the need to educate people about how to properly put on a mask, how to properly take off a mask. Um, and I will also just say that, especially these fabric masks that people are wearing at home, need to be washed in hot water because if you are wearing it because you think it catches or it prevents the spread of infectious diseases, then that means that you think there are viral particles in that mask. So it's very important that you're washing the mask um, after every use. Um, and it's really important that that's done um, because now we are expected to wear these uh, in public places. So the messaging on that has changed. I think that that um, is a little bit problematic for the public in terms of what to believe and, and who to believe. But I do think that um, if people are to be wearing masks, it's really important to put on the mask only from um, the uh, ear handles um, and to take off the mask only from the ear handles. Don't touch the actual uh, part of the mask that's covering your nose and your mouth because that's where the uh, viral particles could be um, could be lying. And so those are just some important things to think about when wearing masks um, and things to think about that I've been thinking about this week. So I hope that that's helpful and I'm happy to answer any questions as well. Thanks very much, Nadia. Uh, Phil? Okay, thank you, Eric. Um, thank you, Nadia, for that superb summary. So there, there's a couple of points I'll make. Uh, the first is that if you go back to the global map, that Nadia had put up. There, 
there are some some signs of hope. They're, they're faint signs, I will acknowledge, but at least at least they exist and we should be aware of them. There we are, good. All right, so if we go down to the lower right and look at that yellow line graph that um, Nadia pointed to before, that shows the the upward trend in cases. This is this is for the U.S. And that's that's the number of confirmed cases. Now, if you go over two tabs to the right, where it says day, first of all, go one tab to the light where it says logarithmic. If you can click on that, underneath the graph, I'll show you a somewhat different shape. Did somebody do that? I'm sorry, I don't have control of it. There it is. So that's the logarithmic graph, and there's maybe maybe you need the eye of faith to see this, but there's a little sense that maybe the curve is starting to flatten. And then go to the third tab under that graph, which says daily increase. That one. And there's, maybe it's just a blip, maybe it's not permanent at all, but there's at least a hint of a downward trend over there to the right. And, and I, I, I was looking for that this morning because as many of you know, I spent a long time in New York City before I came back to BC two years ago. My old hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, has been absolutely inundated with cases. And um, New York is just reporting in the last 48 hours that there's some slight, very slight decline in the number of cases. So maybe that's a sign that we're at least getting close to the peak. I, it, we certainly are not at the peak yet. The peak is going to roll across the United States and across the world uh, at different times in different places. but but maybe the end is in sight. I was to also, I was talking yesterday with people in Italy, in Northern Italy, in, in the Bologna area, and um, they're reporting that there seems to be some beginning of a downward trend on that. Uh, Professor Vicini may have more detailed information on that since Bologna is his hometown. But that's what I heard in a brief conversation with people over there yesterday. So. As Father Tom Stegeman said in his Palm Sunday message uh, this past Sunday to the Boston College community, he said, we will, we will get through this. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Um, and none of us can predict yet what will be the slope, the shape of the downslope, how long it will extend out in time. But it, at least, you know, there's some faint signs that it may be coming. And China, of course, has drastically reduce their number of cases by virtue of a draconian lockdown, which probably would not be likely, I should think, in this country or in most European countries. But it does show that control can be achieved. It's just a question of how bold and aggressive national and state leadership want to be. All right, so that's 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 the first point I wanted to make. The, the second thing I, I want to shout out the various governors around the United States who have really taken strong action to try to slow the spread, stop the spread of COVID-19 within their states. And this is really the obverse of the, of the charts that Nadia just showed you. The, the governors who have be, be, behaved aggressively, who have taken strong evidence-based action and not been persuaded by Fox News that this whole thing is a hoax the states that are that are getting on top of the problem. And, and as Nadia pointed out, uh, the converse is true in the states that are still allowing people to gather in large groups. I just saw something in the paper this morning that um, a group of um, calling themselves the freedom something, I forget the second word, the freedom something in the state of Idaho are planning a gathering of many thousands of people on Easter Sunday, which I think is most unfortunate. Appreciate the sentiment, but not the action. Um, the last point I wanted to make was to talk about a fascinating article that uh, was published two days ago and picked up this morning by the New York Times. And this is a paper that was published by a group at Harvard School of Public Health, looking at the geographical intersection between COVID-19 deaths and air pollution. Uh, as you know, our Global Observatory on Pollution and Health at Boston College is deeply involved in studies of air pollution, mapping air pollution across the United States and across the world. So I was, I was immediately caught by this article, which was put out by a superb group 
at the Harvard School of Public Health. And that what they did was really conceptually quite simple and elegant in its simplicity in that they put two data sets together. They, they took the COVID-19 data that you saw on the map from Johns Hopkins a few minutes ago, and that data is available by county. And they correlated that with county by county information that they have on levels of air pollution. They looked at, I think, at mean annual air pollution level, PM 2.5, fine particulate air pollution, county by county in the United States. And what they found was a very strong correlation that counties with higher rates of air pollution at a higher death rate from COVID-19. And they were even able to calculate a positive dose response between the two that every one microgram increase in annual average air pollution produces, if my memory is correct, a 15% increase in mortality from, from, um, from COVID. So that, ha that has several implications. Uh, number one, it think back to what Nadia said a few minutes ago about the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on poor, minority, disenfranchised, marginalized communities in this country. Well, it turns out, no real surprise when you think about it, that those are the very same communities across the United States that suffer the heaviest rates of air pollution and other forms of environmental degradation, a phenomenon that's been termed environmental injustice. So on top of less, less, uh, less effective access to health care, possibly substandard health care, the, the environmental factors are going to further increase rates of disease and death in, in, in these towns. And it, it, by the way, it's biologically plausible. It makes, it makes sense from a medical point of view that air pollution and COVID should somehow synergize and that COVID is an infection that basically attacks the lung, the respiratory symptom system. And uh, we know already that people who are smokers have higher death rates from COVID. We know that people who have chronic lung disease have higher death rates. And air pollution is really a dilute form of cigarette smoke. And so it, it makes perfectly good sense that, um, uh, that, they, that they should be correlated. Also think about, Nadia had mentioned the, the global south. Um, there's several things to think about there. Think about countries like India and China, but India in particular, where the air pollution is now the worst in the world in the cities of North India. Um, when COVID hits there, and it's it's about to, or maybe already had, uh, it's very likely that the death toll will be much more severe. The death, the case fatality ratio, will be much more severe there than here because not only because of medical care system that's not as good as ours, but also because of the air pollution, the extraordinary, sometimes triple digits, even quadruple digit levels of air pollution that people in India experience, and even though I know the one final point that I'm done with regard to the third world, I, I know that the Johns Hopkins chart is not reporting a lot of cases from sub-Saharan Africa and, and South America, but through some of my communications over the last few days, I'm, I'm, I've heard from physicians in Brazil that they're being slammed. I heard from physicians in Rwanda and sub-Saharan Africa that they're being slammed. So I think there may be a gap between the reality on the ground in those countries and data reporting, and that the, the reported absence of cases in those countries may be more of an artifact than a reality. So that's, that's something to track in the days and weeks ahead. So thank you, Eric, and um, back to you. Thank you, Phil, very much. Uh, let's turn to uh, Andrea Vicini. Thank you very much, Andrea, for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Nadia. Thank you, Phil. I would like to share some thoughts, trying to answer the question, what are we learning from what's happening now in the world? We asked the same question with some of my students in my course on ethics of global public health and the common good. And I want to focus, and some are here online, and we have a class uh, half an hour after we end our session, our fire chat, fireside chat. I think we are learning things about health, about society and about ourselves. 
So I want to share some comments on this, and then if I still have time, I want to see concretely how we address uh, the limited resources, the, the issues raised by the global pandemic with the limited healthcare resources. So first, what are we learning about health? Now, if we think that health concerns only myself and my own personal health, so health and my, 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 the person, we are realizing that this is not sufficient. We need to add society and uh, we need even to think, not only in terms of our nation, but our world. So we are changing the way in which we think about health. Second, about ourselves. Uh, so we could say positively, health is a personal and social good. What uh, we are discovering is that I cannot separate my health from the health of my neighbor, for the health of someone who is in another continent, whether it is uh, uh, of another race, of another ethnicity, or it is in a place where I, I, I have no idea even existed. Second about ourselves, we are discovering our vulnerability. We had plenty of certainties and plenty of stability and security, particularly in the global north, and we're discovering that this can change from one day to another. And that there are persons among ourselves, or maybe we are among those who are more vulnerable because we are elderly, because we are disability, because we are from a minority, as Nadia was saying. I add articles and data concerning Milwaukee, uh, where the, there is an incredible spreading of the pandemic among those who are the poor in that American city. And uh, the fact that the data that we have of the monitoring of the cases from the Center for Disease Control is not yet focusing on who is affected. And I don't want to add any racial discrimination, but maybe it is helpful to know that there are among those who are vulnerable, some who are affected more than others because of their social condition, because of their marginalization, because of the lack of access to healthcare resources. Then we discovered that there are other persons we thought we could separate from ourselves, but if we don't care about our health, we are all going to suffer, the homeless, uh, the refugees, the migrants. So really we cannot think about health in ways that separate us from one another. We discover a new sisterhood, a new brotherhood, and uh, ways in which we can address it is with increased solidarity. We notice, sadly, there are negative responses. We respond to these new discoveries about the fact that we are all connected and we are all vulnerable creating further separation, thinking that we can protect ourselves if we separate the others. In terms of society, we are discovering that there are social responses that are helpful. Uh, physical distancing is an example. Uh, intervening, protecting those who are uh, more vulnerable in our, you know, and isolated in our neighborhoods is a way in which we can uh, make a difference. And the fact that we should have testing for everyone and, uh, and, and use it in a way that helps us to have a better grasp of what's happening uh, should be a social response. And we have seen that in countries where this response has been more accurate, one example featured on, on the media is Germany, uh, uh, are caring better for the health issues and the social issues. Also, in terms of society, we're discovering that what concerns our health has very large repercussions. Think of the economy and the fact that we have you know, over 10 million only in the US of persons who are unemployed because they lost their jobs. And the fact that we could respond to their needs differently if they say we want to protect their jobs and instead of just you know, uh, firing them or uh, letting them you know, take care of their own uh, needs on, on their own. Also, we could say in terms of uh, society, we are discovering that uh, we can foster a stronger solidarity even among scientists. And so part of the solution could be the way in which we create possibilities for sharing information, doing research together across the planet, avoid patenting so that the vaccines that will be available as soon as we will be able to prove that they are 
uh, efficacious, uh, they can be made available for everyone and likewise for the drugs. So it seems to me that we are, we could learn from something that is tragic, like uh, the global pandemic that we're experiencing, that there are different ways of uh, responding to crisis. Ways in which we have uh, a vision of the person, of society, and of health that is shaped by caring for what is the good for everyone, for what is really going to be beneficial for everyone. Now, briefly, I want to address a very difficult issue that is uh, surfacing during this pandemic. We are discovering we don't have uh, what is needed to respond to it, that we are unprepared, that we don't have enough uh, protective uh, personal equi equipment, we don't have enough uh, beds in intensive care units, we don't have enough ventilators to address the very serious uh, respiratory needs of these patients, we don't have enough trained personnel to be able to provide the care that is needed. We don't have enough testing kits. So we are discovering, maybe it is one of the first times in the recent decades in the global north where we are experiencing that despite our technological uh, progress and advance, adva advancement, we are not yet ready to face a global pandemic. So we need to make choices with limited resources or with the fact that, that we are not able to produce what is needed in time uh, to address the needs. So in this emergency, we are turning to the criteria that we used in other similar situations of emergency, when there is a terrorist attack and there is a large number of patients arriving to a hospital, or when there is a natural disaster, uh, uh, when uh, there has been a similar emergency on a smaller scale. And so we look at the protocols for choosing the patients who need to receive care and which type of care. And we uh, need to also make decisions when patients are in a clinical situation and we have a limited number, for example, of ventilators that we can make available. I would say that while we do this, I want to continue to ask the question, why do we have so few ventilators for the needs that we could have anticipated. If you go back to check uh, recent articles in the recent years, I found one from 2008, anticipating that we'll have to face pandemics. And uh, still, we were not able to implement the strategies to address a global pandemic that was announced and anticipated. So when we have to face these difficult decisions, we need to ask, what do we want to achieve? How we can achieve uh, benefits for the patients who are in need of care. Uh, how can we achieve it as much as possible, these benefits for all the patients? How can we do it with the limited resources that we have? And we want to focus our decisions based on the situation of the patient and uh, on the expected outcomes. And, and we want to avoid any type of discrimination uh, that is based on other factors that are not health-based. Uh, we do want also, we want also to be aware that maybe we need to make a preference in terms of uh, uh, those who can be more beneficial in this global pandemic. And what is surface is maybe we need to be attentive to the healthcare professionals who are you know, affected as everybody else and so need to be protected if you want the society to be able to respond to the needs with healthcare professionals who have the training to provide the services needed. It seems also that it is helpful to protect from very difficult decisions, they say to withdraw a ventilator or to withhold the ventilator. And so maybe we need to have persons who are those who make the decisions, the triage team and who are not the persons who are caring for the patients. And we need still to continue to empower the patients, helping them to be able to express their will uh, with their directives, uh, with the, the decisions to not be resuscitated if they want to express them. And you know, uh, for those who uh, uh, come from religious traditions, we are again invited to think about issues related to suffering, 
related to death, related to what will happen after death, so about meaning in our own lives. And these have a, an impact and influence on the patient's level and might be helpful to make decisions in difficult situations. I stop here and I look forward to continuing the conversation with the questions. Thank you so much, Andrea. We really appreciate uh, your insights there and for joining us today. Um, let's open up for conversation as usual. We, um, I'll remind everyone that we are recording the session and so your questions will be recorded as well, which is uh, great. Your, your questions I'm sure will be shared by many others who watch this um, in the coming weeks ahead. Um, you're welcome to raise a digital hand using the button at the bottom of your screen or also enter them into the chat box. And we have one question already from Zara um, asking about whether the uh, new guidelines on the virus, uh, the use of masks is saying that the virus is actually airborne, uh, is transmissible uh, via airborne contact rather than surface and droplet transmission only. Um, would uh, Phil or Andrea, yeah, I want to, Phil, why don't you start with that? Yeah, well, the distinction between droplet spread and airborne spread is an old one. It probably goes back to at least the 1950s and it was used to distinguish, um, uh, it was based on the technology of the day, which distinguished between diseases that were spread only within a very close radius of patients versus diseases that really could spread long distances, for example, through hospital ventilation systems. In the latter category were TB and smallpox and a, another very vicious virus that we haven't heard much from lately, Marburg virus, which caused an epidemic in Germany when it actually went out the windows on one floor of a hospital and came in the windows on the floor above. But, it, but one of the things that's coming out is people start to think more intensively about this distinction, this dichotomy between droplet and airborne, and, and they've applied modern technology to it. You begin to see that it's not a strict separation, that there's a, that there's a continuum and that when a person coughs or sneezes, not all the particles are big particles that fall out within a couple of meters. Some of them are much smaller and can travel further. So I, th I think it's still, people are still debating it and probably debating it for a long time. But my guess is when the dust settles um, that we'll find that this infection is spread mainly by droplets, but there is possibly also an airborne component um, I can send it to you, Eric, after this talk, and then you can put it out to everybody who's on the talk. But there was um, uh, a colleague sent me a video just two days ago, I think, from uh, some researchers in Japan who have applied some state-of-the-art laser imaging technology to, to map the spread of droplets that emerge from the nose and, and mouth when a person coughs or sneezes. And you see that there's actually a, a range of sizes where most of the particles being big settle out quickly, but some at least, some, sub, some subset can, can go farther. So I think that, that creates a, a justification for the mass and it reinforces the need for social distancing. I will say there was a study done in a laboratory setting uh, that I mentioned, I think last week that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And again, this is a laboratory setting, it's very controlled. We can't, we can't account for real life situations of temperature and humidity. But in the lab, they did find that the virus could be aerosolized for three hours. So if you then consider that there could be changes to temperature or humidity or wind or all sorts of other things, there could be evidence for aerosolization. But I think the general agreement um, is that uh, the main forms of transmission right now are droplet um, transmission and then, of course, surface or fomite transmission. Thank you very much, Nadia. Um, we have a question in the chat, but also uh, a hand raised from Nicola Rue. Would you like to uh, share your uh, uh, video there, uh, Nicola, and ask your question? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if anyone knew more about, I saw a New, a New York Times article today about um, using the BCG vaccine um, for tuberculosis for COVID-19 and there have been some, I think, clinical trials starting. There was one in Australia and then someone um, at MGH is trying to get one started here in Boston. 
um, wondering if anyone could comment on that or like knows anything more about that. Okay, Phil, yeah. Yeah, well, um, there have certainly been, there's been a lot of talk in the last two or three weeks about both treatments and, and vaccines. So let me say a word about both of those. Vaccines are clearly the ultimate solution to this infection. But what people need to understand is that even under the best of circumstances, even with a national or an international mobilization, my bet is that a minimum of 12 to 18 months will be required to produce a vaccine. And the, the reason for that is you have to think about what a vaccine is. It, it's basically a virus that's either been inactivated, in other words, killed by a chemical like formaldehyde, or a virus that's been attenuated, which means that people in the laboratory have played with the virus's genetic material so that it's still a living virus, but less likely to cause disease than the, than the wild type virus. And then what you do with the vaccine, whether it's inactivated or attenuated, you have to do field trials to see first if it's safe and secondly, if it confers protection. So you start by giving it to just a very, very small number of people, maybe three or five people. Um, if they survive, then you give it to 10 or 15. And if they survive, you give it to maybe 100. And at that point, you more or less within, at least in terms of gross disease, you've, you've established safety. And, um, and then you've got to do still broader field trials to see if the vaccine actually produces antibodies in people and, and confers protection. And even with the most highly dedicated effort and unlimited resources, those steps need to play out in real time. And so it just, it just takes time to do, and that's also assuming that everything goes right the first time through, and it usually doesn't. So that's, that's vaccines. I, I'm delighted that people are thinking about it. I hope that one comes along but I don't expect it um, uh, any time in, in, in the year 2020. With regard to treatments, I think there's, there's more likelihood that something um, will come up sooner. There, there certainly are some very good antiviral drugs out there that have been used for HIV AIDS, um, the, the so-called high efficiency antiretroviral therapy for AIDS. You have the Tamiflu that's been developed to fight influenza. So there are, antiviral agents. Um, I know that a number of hospitals around the, the country, including MGH, are, are doing clinical trials. There's a, there's, a, there's a drug called remdesivir, which is, which is on trial in, se in several places and, and a couple of others. There's been talk about chloroquine, the anti-malarial agent. Uh, one well-known American has been advocating its use. Um, I've read about the BCG. Uh, so far as I know, all of these clinical trials are still in relatively early stage. If you have more updated information, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But my understanding is they're still early, but clinical trials move a lot faster than vaccine trials. And conceivably, we could have information about a drug that, that is beneficial within, within a matter of weeks or months. Okay, thanks uh, very much. Uh, we had a question from um, Josh Rappaport asking uh, whether there are plans for the U.S. to share resources internationally once it's produced uh, enough kits to do so, uh, and whether there's inf sufficient infrastructure, he lists qPCR machines uh, to perform the test. Who wants to take that? There has been an initial collaboration about uh, sharing information on the virus, but then the research at the moment, uh, both for drugs and vaccines, is uh, more uh, isolated. So at least I'm not aware of uh, a leadership in creating forms of collaboration. I no idea what will happen if we'll have something uh, like in terms of treatments or you know, a vaccine, you know, as Phil uh, indicated, you know, in, in the mid long term. Uh, but I personally would want this conversation to, to occur. And then uh, I would, really appreciate leadership uh, from scientists, uh, uh, from uh, politicians uh, joining the leadership of ethicists in uh, trying to make a case for we need uh, equal access 
to the resources that will help us to promote health for everyone everywhere. No discrimination based on any type of uh, financial, you know, incentive. Everyone should be able to be tested, be vaccinated, and uh, be treated. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we had a question from uh, Pranav Parid. Could you uh, share your screen and jump in? Yeah, thank you. Um, I had a question for um, all three of you. So I understand that scientific studies must be rigorous and slow and tedious in order to get results that can be trusted. Um, I guess both in terms of drug testing and the messaging about masks that Dr. Wellson was talking about earlier. Um, as scientists in the communication arena, how do you properly convey this idea to laymen and women who develop distrust after they receive mixed signaling um, over time, just naturally as the scientific process continues? Yeah, that's a that's a, a very important question. I think maybe the historical model for building trust is the one that Eric alluded to at the beginning of this this hour, where he talked about FDR communicating very directly, like the the twentieth uh, century equivalent of Zoom, to the whole American public, and and speaking authoritatively factually and honestly. They didn't really need to issue correction notices or notices of misspeaking after those fireside chats because the guy told it straight. I think we're seeing that kind of leadership right now in New York with Governor Cuomo speaking very directly, very honestly, in a very unvarnished way to, to people. No form of communication is perfect. There's always going to be some people who disbelieve. But I think when, when leaders really speak the truth and it's verifiable and, they, and, and what they say today is borne out by reality on the ground over the next few days and not by some, uh, some other reality, that uh, it, 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 it's the way you, you reconstruct trust. There's a lot of distrust um, of authority figures in the world today, as we, as we know. But um, the only way to get to build the, the trust back is, is brick by brick and honest communication by honest communication. Another, yeah. go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Another example is what's happening in Germany. The leadership of uh, Angela Merkel joined with uh, a, an accurate health plan to address the emergency is what is uh, showing results in this country with the reduced number of deaths despite the very number of persons who tested positive and the commitment to be at the service of the citizens. So the leadership is really at the service of the well-being of the citizens in a way that the citizens appreciate and, uh, and deserve. Thank Nadia, you very sorry. much. You yeah, go ahead, to say Nadia. Well, no, I was, I was actually going to think about it from your perspective as a student or someone who has perhaps family members or friends who may be wanting more scientific information. And I actually think, and I've said this before, that we each have a role to play in communicating effective information. And your family is going to trust what you say. If you come in with, as Phil said, accurate facts, accurate science, and if you, if you're, you know, if you have the same platform every single time you talk to someone, um, they have no reason not to believe you, especially if you have no sort of uh, <laughs> no sort of ingenuity or perhaps uh, some hidden agenda as well. So I think making sure that you're speaking accurately to your family, to your friends, um, making sure you're educated yourself about the reasons why we need a scientific process, I think could be helpful to sort of changing people's minds on a local community level, which could be powerful uh, nationwide as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, a great question. Uh, I have a question from Nani Bauza, uh, and then we'll go to the digital hands that are raised uh, as well. Um, the question is, what's your opinion about increasing your level of pH found in certain foods like mango, pineapple, or oranges? Do you know what level we have to get it up to and how we know we have increased the pH level? Is that to kill the virus perhaps? Um, either the maybe uh, doctors can jump in here. Well, um, I'll, I'll say to that, it's, it's almost impossible to change the pH in your body. Uh, the human body is absolutely dependent upon having a steady pH. Every one of our 
<clears throat> enzyme systems is finely tuned, finely calibrated to produce optimal function within an extremely narrow range of pH. And when pH goes off in people who are seriously sick, for example, with chronic kidney disease, um, the body deteriorates very quickly. You, you can't eat mangoes or drink a lot of orange juice and change your body pH. The, there's so much calcium in your body, so much <clears throat> calcium with an alkaline pH that it'll immediately buffer the, um, the acid that you put in. Okay, thanks very much. Um, let's go to uh, Jenna uh, Mew, who had her hand digitally raised there. Hi. Um, I was reading an article about how in a town hall, Dr. Fauci mentioned that um, the tension between like federal mandates and states' rights could maybe explain why each state isn't in lockdown. Um, so I was wondering if maybe any of you could speak more about this tension or more broadly about what makes the U.S. especially unique, um, either in a good or bad way when confronting this pandemic. Great, thanks. Anyone? I, I can speak to that. Um, so when it comes to public health, the United States is a federation. <clears throat> We're not a, a holistic unit the way we are in foreign policy. Uh, it's ac actually public health policies and practices are determined state by state by state. So for example, we have the National Institutes of Health. It's a, it's a, it's a national organization that produces brilliant research, but, um, but that's all we do. The CDC is an action-oriented public health agency, but um, CDC um, uh, uh, can only go into a state if a state in, invites them in. Um, the states have, have the power here. So oh, this shows yeah. this shows uh, the fact that political rationales can uh, trump uh, uh, regarding and uh, even in the area of health. So that there is the need uh, the need may be to find a way in which citizens can uh, help their leaders to make decisions not based on uh, political rationales in a negative sense, but on uh, ways in which the citizens can be protected. So it seems to me that we as citizens have a role to play. And I understand it is difficult because we feel disempowered in a situation like a global pandemic, but maybe we can try to find ways in which we can take back some of our empowerment and, and, and ask for a greater respect of uh, norms of uh, physical distancing in society so that those who are more vulnerable are protected. So that there is a more prudent approach and that there is a nationwide approach so that the states you know, uh, uh, see what's happening you know, uh, in the neighboring states. Good, let's move on to uh, Rosie Youngquist. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, uh, jump in with a question. Sure, so um, my question is going back to what Nadia was talking about earlier in regards to the masks. I was just wondering, I guess, was what was the like event that caused the CDC to kind of change its tune on wearing masks, especially given that we have the shortage now? So is there like a new study that came out that kind of like, said why they are now saying the public should have one. And then also my understanding before was that they were saying that the virus is so small that the regular masks that we get aren't all that effective anyways. So I, I guess if you could also speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I, I find this uh, mask discussion to be really confusing myself because I feel like we're sort of jumping back and forth between uh, recommendations. My understanding was that there was a study that was done recently comparing countries where masks were quite common, um, commonly worn at the beginning of the epidemic, comparing countries where masks were not commonly worn, and there was a sort of a difference in the number of transmissions that occurred. Now, there are a lot of flaws with that study. Um, you cannot really make any causal conclusions from that study. 
Um, but I do think that uh, given the fact that we know there's a significant amount of community transmission that's occurring, um, and given the fact that people still need to go to the grocery store, still need to be able to access these locations, um, asking people to put a scarf around their face or asking people to wear a mask doesn't seem like that big of a uh, ask uh, from an individual perspective. Um, and if it has a preventative benefit, then that's sort of another reason why we might be encouraged to do that. Um, so I'll stop there and see if Phil or, or anybody else wants to jump in. No, I, 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 there's not much to add to that. The problem is there's a lot of uncertainty here. The facts are changing on the ground. And, um, and I, I also suspect that CDC leadership wanted to be seen to be doing something. We have a question from uh, Harry Sean Magam uh, asking, is there a sense of how best to ease social distancing protocols uh, ostensibly before herd immunity is established or a vaccine is approved without causing a second spike of infections? I've heard discussions about letting people go back to work by age groups or COVID recovery certifications, but there seems to be significant scaling and ethical, uh, scaling problems and ethical considerations. Uh, all three of you are well suited to answer this, so jump in as you will. I would say something to consider that might help us, but it would require, I will say there are buts, it would require significant work, workforce, um, and it also would re require us to get the number of transmissions down is something called contact tracing, which is essentially being able to, for every infected person, being able to trace their contacts for the last two weeks. And so it, it sounds just as uh, laborious uh, as, as it, the process actually is, um, but that is a proposed mechanism for helping us get out of this phase of social distancing. But again, we'd need a significant workforce and we'd also need the number of community transmissions to go down. There are ways that this is already happening, happening digitally. So if you receive alerts from the Massachusetts Department of Public Health, they do have a digital forum right now that they're trying to get people to sign on to. I do have some concerns with the privacy associated with this because it would essentially use your phone to figure out who you were closest to in the past two weeks. Um, but this could be one way to do some contact tracing using the technology that we have today. So that would be one way to help us ease out of social distancing in combination with a number of other prevention measures. Yeah, one other, one other thought here concerns herd immunity. So the concept of herd immunity means that there is such a high uh, prevalence of people with antibodies in the population that spread of disease is impossible. And typically, you can't talk about herd immunity until the number of people in a population who are protected against the disease is up around 95 or 98 percent. Those, those are the kind of rates that we have enjoyed in this country. For example, people that are protected against measles or, or polio, although of course there are pockets of people that haven't had their kids vaccinated across the country. It's well up into the 90 percent of children are vaccinated. And that's why when uh, when measles comes in, except in some isolated communities, if it spreads at all, there are one or two secondary cases and then it, and then it dies out. I, I can't imagine that even with widespread infection by COVID-19, including mild infection, I can't imagine that we're going to get up into the 90% range. I may be wrong, but my guess is that when all is said and done, it'll be 60 or 70 or maybe 80% of the population that will have had the, the infection in, in one or another degree of severity, but it's not going to be 95%. So, and what that means, therefore, is that there'll still be significant numbers of people in the population who are susceptible to the virus if it gets reintroduced. And so that's something that um, people like Boston College leadership are going to have to think about as they think about when do we allow students and faculty to come back into contact with each other. And I don't think anybody knows yet. It's something that we're going to have to watch and, um, and, and uh, wait and watch. Another factor Andrea. that adds to the uncertainty is that we do not, know, do not know yet, as far as I know, how long the antibodies will be present and will help us to be protected because it is a new infection and because we don't have an idea of, you know, 
let's say, a person who was infected and has antibodies, the antibodies are present, let's say, for five years. Well, it's just beginning. So we don't know if they're going to be a short term or a mid term or a, a long term. And so until we have even that element, we are uncertain and we cannot answer if we risk of being reinfected or not. If we have sufficient protection in our bodies after being infected, or if we develop you know, resistance without even being infected because of the, the, the social exposure to the virus. We just have about uh, two minutes left and I know that uh, Nadia needs to leave uh, right at one, but um, I had one last question for Andrea, uh, if you might, just as we, as we close. Uh, I know you're in contact with lots of friends and colleagues uh, back in Italy, and I'm wondering if there are lessons from Milan or Lombardy or other parts of Italy that we might learn here in the United States um, uh, about what, what things look like as the, as the curve begins to flatten and people take stock of what, uh, uh, both among your religious brothers, uh, but also your medical uh, brothers in Italy. I, I think it's a lesson that we are learning from all over the world, and Italy confirms it. We cannot undermine the, the seriousness of the pandemic. And we need to respond with what we have at our disposal, uh, what is available to us, that is uh, with physical distancing, with uh, try to contain infection. So everyone has repeated, is repeating that we need to wash our hands, be attentive to our contacts, be prudent and be attentive to those who are vulnerable. In Italy, somehow uh, this was not what happened. And then so then there was this uh, way, uh, there, there was, the healthcare system was overwhelmed by the number of uh, you know, persons infected and the gravity of the infection and the difficulty of uh, providing care to, to the, the patients. What I think hasn't surfaced yet, uh, but it is in, uh, an element present at least in the Italian situation, is uh, the way in which uh, people responded with uh, generosity from the healthcare professionals to citizens who donated money so that uh, money is now available to build uh, emergency hospitals. Just to give one example, in one area that is not one of the most affected, but still significantly affected, that is the area around Bologna, Phil mentioned that before, the citizens donated to the regional government 10 million of euros and that money will be used to build the hospital. So there has been, uh, you know, in terms of money, and then in terms of uh, expertise, to build the hospital need electricians. They asked 25 electricians, 250 responded. Likewise, you know, they needed healthcare professionals, physicians and nurses uh, in the areas affected. They asked for 200 and they got 1,000, etc. So there has been also this element that I think is important that we rediscover our common humanity and our uh, interconnectedness in trying to respond together to the gravity of the situation, even when we don't have everything that we need uh, from a healthcare point of view. And I think this is an important element. This is an asset when we think about uh, a global pandemic. The citizens, their generosity, their compassion, their care, they desire to help others who are in need. Amen. Uh, and thank you, uh, Andrea, for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, especially Phil and Nadia. Um, and uh, Andrea, I hope we'll see you again at one of these sessions. Um, to the rest of you, thank you for checking in with us today. We hope you'll join us next week and each week through the end of the semester as we continue this conversation. Uh, take care of each other and stay safe, and we will see you again very soon. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.